first of all, I'd like to thank everybody who is here for coming to listen to my speech and uh, to all the people who are online uh, now and in the future who will see it. Um, so what we're going to do first of all is um, I'm going to talk to you about the aims or what we're going to cover today. Okay, so we're going to cover six main things. The first is uh, what is a corpus, what is corpus linguistics, and uh, who use corpora. Okay. Um, the second thing is we're going to look at where we can find corpora. So we'll look at the different types of ones and uh, where they are readily available for us. Um, the third one is a really important thing. is We're going to have a look really at what can a corpus tell us. What type of information can we get from this? And then I'm going to talk to you about my interest in corpora, where it came from, and the research uh, that I have done using this technology. Then we're going to go into the much more practical side of things. We're going to be looking at how you yourself can build a corpora. We're going to go through it step by step. So I'll ask for any really tech savvy people to uh, bear with me, because I'm going to go through it from quite a basic uh, from a quite a basic starting point. And then what we're going to look at finally is probably the most uh, key element of it is how can we bring corpora into the classroom? How can we bring this into classroom activities? But before I begin, I think it's only fair to uh, talk to you a little bit about who I am. Uh, who's this person talking to you? So um, my name is Mark. Um, I'm a CELTA, Tyler, Trinity diploma, and right now I'm finishing my MA in Applied Linguistics and TESOL. And this is where really my interest in corpora has uh, come from. I have 11 years uh, teaching experience in Spain, six years working for the British Council in the RB Abithiosa office, and uh, for the last three years working as the ICT and at other times Young Learners Coordinator. So I have a fair bit of experience, but this is the first time that uh, I'm being streamed live, so I think I will ask you to uh, have some patience with me. So when I found out I was going to be streamed live, I actually I, I asked my wife. My wife, she's very clever. Uh, I asked her, uh, what should I do to make this a really interesting speech? You know, I'm going to be streamed. I want people to watch it. What should I do? And she was, uh, her first comment was, don't talk about corpora. And I said, well, unfortunately, that's part of the game. I, I have to talk about corpora. So she said, well, start with a joke. So I thought I would start with a corpora joke for you. Okay, so there was a wealthy nurse, a rich teacher, and an affluent banker in a lift, and five pounds on the floor. Who picked it up? The banker, as the other two don't exist. Okay, so what we can see here is, uh, for the joke, for it to make it a corporate joke, we can have a look, and we have these three words that I've used, three different words. We've got wealthy, affluent, and rich. Now, when you go to your class uh, in the next days, and you obviously steal my joke because it's fantastic. Um, the first thing that is going to happen is little Pepe is going to turn around to you and go, teacher, what is the difference between those three words? OK, so this brings up a really interesting question. What is the difference between these three words? OK, so um, normally we would go, oh, are they more or less mean the same thing? They're very similar. They're synonyms. OK, but there's a reason why we have three different words. Okay? They're to express different things. And one of the ways which we can look at and discover uh, the reason that we have these different words is by incorporating and using corpuses, okay, or corpora. So I'm going to set you some questions. Okay? Hopefully, right now, you can't answer any of them. And hopefully, and much more importantly, I hope that by the end of my talk that you're going to feel confident that you can answer all of them. So the first one is, what do you need to know to be able to understand a word? Okay. Then, specifically, do you know the word doting? What can you tell people about it? Then this third one, can you think of words in English and American English, or British English and American English, that are the same but have subtle differences? And the last question, and really the key and most important one, is how could you use a corpus with your class? So let's get on to the first of the points that I said I was going to talk about, which is uh, what is a corpus, what is corpus linguistics, and who use corpus? So what's a corpus? 
It's basically anything. You're going to hear me using this word text a lot. You're going to hear me using this word text a lot. But I want you to think of text not just as what is written down on a piece of paper. Text can be a dialogue between two people. It can be a conversation that you overhear uh, at the people on the, in the cafe sat next to you. That is a text. It is a, a sharing of information. So basically, a corpus is a collection of text, whether that be uh, from newspapers, whether that be from political speeches, whether that be from your favorite soap opera, uh, magazines or even radio TV sh- uh, radio shows. All of these things would fit into what we would describe as a text. And a corpus is a collection of these texts. Okay, so um, this is where they come from, but what does it look like? That's what it really looks like, okay, which is a huge uh, jumbled piece of mess, really. Okay, and it's going to look incredibly difficult to actually use that. This is where the technology comes in. So let's move on to that second question then. So what is corpus linguistics to talk about it? Now, I went and uh, I read up. I um, listened to Nesselhoff, okay? And he described it. He said, corpus linguistics is a method of carrying out linguistical analysis. Usually, the analysis is performed with the help of the computer, with specialized software, and takes into account the frequency of the phenomena investigated. So corpus linguistics... Thus is the analysis of naturally occurring language on the basis of computerized corpora. And I went, okay, so what is corpus linguistics? Okay. And for me, I broke it down to a much more simple definition. Corpus linguistics, for me, is a data-driven approach to analyzing language. So... But there are a couple of key things that need to be remembered when we say this, a data-driven approach for analyzing language. That doesn't mean that um, the human element of corpus linguistics is removed. A lot of people seem to think it's like you put the information in a computer, the computer gives you the answer. No. The computer gives you a possibility to analyze large quantities of information that would be impossible without it. The analysis has got to be based on a human interpretation of that information. But what we're doing by including, with corpus linguistics, by including this great quantity of information, we're, we're able to go from assumptions based on information rather than gut feelings that can be affected by... Uh, different cultural elements, uh, where our, back, our backgrounds, where we come from, all these things can affect um, and influence uh, our opinions. And therefore, when we explain to our students what a word means, maybe we are giving our interpretation rather than a general interpretation of words. So the th- next question we had was, who use corpora? That's a really simple answer, and it's everyone, Okay. If you look now, um, I've got up on here a picture of um, a book quite possibly some of you have used or are using right now, Complete Advanced by Cambridge. Okay? And as we can see, down on the second, the back, the reverse of it, we've got this lovely little white box. So let's look at what it actually says. Okay? It says, Cambridge English Corpus. The Cambridge English Corpus is a multi-billion word collection of written and spoken English. It includes Cambridge Learner Corpus, a unique bank of exam candidate papers. So we can see that publishers now are using the fact that they have built their own corpuses as part of their marketing. It's a way of saying that the language that we are using, that we've selected to include within our books, there's a reason for it. It's not just because Fred thinks that that's a really good expression. It's because we've analyzed it and we've seen that this expression occurs this many times, which is far more frequent than this expression that we used to teach. Okay, so this is the whole idea. It's like corpus linguistics is now being based and built into uh, all these textbooks, textbooks, dictionaries, all these different types of work. It's all throughout. So Cambridge themselves explain the reasons why they use it as that it ensures that the language that is being taught in their publications is natural, accurate, up-to-date. They select the most useful common words and phrases for a topic or level. They focus on certain groups of learners and see what they find easy or hard, and they analyze spoken language so that we can teach it effectively. Okay, I don't think any of us can, dis- uh, can 
argue that these are all great things to aim for. So it's much better to aim for words that, and language which is the most relevant to our students. So corpus linguistics is a way of us doing that. Okay, so to the next big question that we, we, we said we would cover at the beginning of the talk, which is where can we find corpora? And again, thankfully, the answer is everywhere. Okay, as soon as you go onto that internet, there are hundreds of resources for you. Remember, a corpora or the, the concept of corporate linguistics doesn't just lie within these uh, multi-billion word collections of words. There are many different ways. We have things like Wordle, well, Word Clouds, or Google Ngrams as really basic uh, versions of corpora which are uh, available widely to people. If we look really quickly at Wordle or Word Clouds, a lot of these programs are based on uh, frequency. This is a really key element when we talk about words, how frequently the words occur, okay? Because often, you know, you read your students' work and it's like, well, yeah, that word's correct. But, God, I just couldn't imagine somebody using it in that context. So, by something simple like Word, or what we can do is take articles, scan them in to a word cloud, which, based on the frequency that the word um, occurs, differentiates the size of the word. So in the, in the center one, we can see that research is one of the key words, graduate, work, project. All of these are the key words that occur. Okay? So this is one way that we can start to maybe look at our text and get our students to focus on frequency of words and look for the words that appear a lot. Uh, another one is Google Ngrams, okay? which is really interesting. Okay, because what we can do is put in a series of words and uh, Google will talk to us or give us the information about the frequency that that word has appeared, for example, in this context here, over the last 100 years. And what we can see very clearly is that uh, not all words stay as relevant all the time. Okay, so we can have, for example, in the, I think it's the green line. Yeah, the green line is staying pretty much relevant throughout the whole time. But then we've got this uh, uh, red line where we can see that the importance of this word, the more uh, the use of this word is growing, growing over the century now to where it's quite an important word. And then we have the other situation. We have the blue word, which rocketed in importance, okay, and was used constantly and now is dying off. So just by a simple computer uh, uh, thing that you can type into the computer, put three words in, and you can look at the frequency of the words and start to feed back to your students and get them to think about these type of things. Okay, That's not to say that there aren't other larger corpuses that are available to our students. I've put two on here. Uh, if you want to, all the links in the, are in the presentations, which you can download. Um, we have uh, these two websites, which are collectors of corpuses. R not so much they are not a corpus on their own, but what they do are links to different types of specific corpuses. So if you want to look at... Um, American English use of, word, of words in newspapers. They will have a link to a corpus which based, is based on that. So uh, there's corpuses all out there, okay? It's just a simple case of looking at them. To give you one specific example, we got here uh, a corpus which has been built by Time Magazine, which is based on their articles. It can feed to us so much information uh, about the relevance of words. So we talked about, obviously, one of the things that we can see a lot of is, um, well, I jumped ahead, but what we can see a lot of is um, about frequency, but what other things can corpuses tell us? So frequency is the first one we said. We mentioned this earlier, but relevance, okay? With frequency, we can talk about the relevance of words. We can talk about concordance. Okay, so what type of sentences, what type of structures, what type of language around it do we see with that word? Then even more specific, collocations. Let's make it clear the difference between the two, concordance and collocation. Concordance is in, within the sentence structure, whereas collocation, we're looking at the words that go directly together. So we can look at the collocations. What words collocate with this? And then the last one is limits of use. Okay which is really important, okay? 
because uh, often, as I'm sure you have had the experience where you're reading a text and uh, the, student, the students have been asked maybe to write a formal letter of complaint, the traditional formal letter of complaint, and they start it with, hey, mate. Uh, it's just not, uh, the, the limits of the use of that word do not allow it to be used in this context. So uh, corpuses can tell us all these different types of information. So let's pick out a word specifically. And the word we're looking at, as we saw from earlier, is doting. Okay? So what does uh, a dictionary definition of doting tell us? So it tells us the type of word it is. It's an adjective. It gives us a definition of the, what the word is. And it gives us a, a really limited uh, example, okay, where it says doting parents. Then it gives us a second meaning. Okay? So we've got two meanings. Which one is more important? Which one is more common? Which one are our students, when they come across this word, more likely to see? We don't have that type of information. The amount of information that we have is really limited. Now, if we take that word and we put it into, for example, we're going to use the uh, Times Corpus for us here. Uh, now we've got, just off the, first, uh, off the beginning, we've got some really interesting information about this word. So what we can see is the frequency that this word has appeared in Time magazine over the last, more or less, 100 years. And what we can see is that we had our high point in the 50s, where this word was used a bit more. And now we're down to only 12 occasions in the last decade where this word has actually appeared. So what we can see maybe is we can put forward uh, or postulate that the, the relevance of this word is, is, is reducing. Okay. So, and then... What can we, when we look at the 12 instances of this word, what can this tell us? What information is there available for us? We've got the words, we've got the words that surround them. We can look at the context of these words, the type of thing they're trying to look at, and we can see from that that overwhelmingly the uses of the word doting link to our first definition of the meaning. Okay? And then what other assumptions, what other information can we gather from it? Okay. Really interestingly, in my opinion, is the fact that we can look at the words that collocate with it. Okay? Um, four times it collocates with, out of the 12, it collocates with father or daddy, or dad or daddy, and two of them with parents, okay? so, which would include the male figure as well. So uh, six times out of 12, 50% of the times that that word has occurred in the last 10 years, it's occurred linking to the male uh, parent figure. So does that mean that we can then start to make an assumption that it's uh, more of a word that we use more commonly with a father, a father's relationship with their child? Okay. So this is the type of information that corpuses can give us. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my interest in corpora and where it came from, and uh, there's some, a little bit of the research that I did with corpora and to show you some of the things that you can do just for fun because I'm sure you want to. Okay, so I'm going to show you a typical type of slide from a, from a, a textbook. We've all seen this. We've all used this. Uh, British and American English, uh, all of these words that are vitally fundamental for our students to know the difference between flat and apartment, or it's vitally important that they know uh, petrol and gas and all of this. However, um, I know lots of Americans, and when they said to me... Uh, you know, um, I don't know, we need to go to the gas station. I didn't suddenly throw my hands up and say I couldn't understand what you were saying. Okay, I had no problem understanding. In the multicultural world that we live in now, uh, a lot of these differences in meaning are either disappearing or becoming so, uh, so closely knit that it, things like where they say movies and films, I, I always think to myself, I say movies. Okay, am I even American? No, I'm not American. So, okay, so, so what, but that's not the only area where there are differences within language between different countries. So, um, I want to talk to you about really quickly about a situation that occurred to me and was what inspired me to look into this area. And I was with a group of American friends and we were talking about a specific word. Okay, and it's this word, it's gorgeous. Okay, and my friends, um, they, uh, well, as we can see, I don't think any of us are going to argue that this is a, a gorgeous woman, 
Okay, but in uh, an attempt for equality, let's put on a gorgeous man as well. Okay, so we've got some equality. Okay, but uh, we were talking. But we were talking about food. We weren't talking about people. And I turned around and I said, "Oh, the most gorgeous food is obviously fish and chips." Okay, in paper, not in a restaurant, not in a restaurant, in the in the paper. Okay, and all my American friends burst out laughing at me, and they went, "You can't call fish and chips gorgeous." I, was, I got very offended because I thought they were talking badly about fish and chips. Um, but the issue was that for them, gorgeous is an adjective they use to define beauty. And for us uh, in, in British English, or at least for me, um, gorgeous is a word that we can use to describe quality as well. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's fantastic. Okay. So this brings up the idea of semantic prosody. Semantic prosody. Uh, and I'll let Lowe describe it for you. Semantic processes have in large measure and for thousands of years remitten, re remained hidden from our perception and inaccessible to our intuition. This is the, what they mean, what, what Lowe is trying to say is that this idea of, the, of meanings, slight different meanings which are cultural or which uh, are, may not be defined in the dictionary have been hidden to us for a long time. And until we had the ability to put these type of words into corpora and to look at large quantities of information, we were, able to, we were unable to quantify them. So what I decided to do myself was to investigate this area and um, I picked three words, okay? I had socialist, conservative, and liberal. And what I did was I went out and I bought, built a corpora of UK political texts taken from newspapers and US political texts taken from newspapers in an attempt to see if we could define and find clear differences between the uses of these three words. And unsurprisingly, yeah, we could. So the first one, socialist. If you think uh, in six months, of British newspapers, there were 44 references. Whereas in the US, there were only 11. So there was four times more use of this word than in British newspapers than in American newspapers. Um, and of the 11 references in the American newspapers, the majority of them were, he is the socialist leader of this country. Only three of them were actually seemed to be uh, any kind of value judgment on something being socialist. And it was used solely in a negative tense, uh, in a negative manner. It was, uh, I think one of them was, for example, it described uh, a building as looking socialist, looking gray, dingy, and socialist. Okay, So this word was used negatively. Whereas in the UK, we had two great extremes within the words that we found. We had real negatives and some fantastic collocations like champagne socialists which I love, to describe uh, people from elite backgrounds who had joined maybe the socialist movement, champagne socialists. Uh, but then we had the extreme opposite. We had the extreme positivity surrounding this word. We had words like pure, put with socialist, a pure socialist. Yeah? Words that tried to express this idea as being this pure, fantastic idea. So we could see that within these two words, clear differences. And this was mirrored within the other ones. Uh, for example, in liberal, where the word liberal was uh, much more heavily used within the US uh, English than UK English. And the types of words that it could be combined with uh, were completely different. If we looked at the collocations which happened more than once, uh, there was only one word between the two that actually collocated, and it was opposition, liberal opposition. But we had in the US things like their legal system being described as liberal when with collocations like liberal courts and liberal judges, which just never appear within UK English. Okay? And then if we come down to conservatives, uh, the word conservative, we, um, when once again we discounted references to conservative party with a big C, um, we had 70 references within six months in British newspapers and 587 within American newspapers. A staggering difference between the two of them. And again, we could see great dramatic differences in the words that we link to each other. So we had, again, their legal system described as conservative. Religion, which I think most of us maybe could have predicted that one could have arisen. But really interesting, radio was a heavy, 
uh, collocation, conservative radio, which I would never personally myself, being an English person, think about using. Okay? So this brings up a really interesting idea, in my opinion. It's like, are we, when we're looking at variations in language between different countries, looking at the right things? Rather than looking at petrol and gas, or let's think of some more sidewalk and pavement and things like this, which are not really getting in the way of communication uh, so much now in the world that we're living in, should we be looking at really these, this, this, the differences in semantic prosody between the languages? Because this is where maybe uh, offense can be caused, okay? And this is where the real differences really lie within the languages. Okay, so it's an idea for you to put, put out to you to see what you think. Okay, so we're going to move on now to the much more practical side of it. As I said, uh, please forgive me uh, for anybody here, uh, because I'm going to who knows about corpuses and how to build them, because I'm going to go from the beginning. In a hope that I want to be able to show you that it's really uh, not actually that difficult to do. It can be a little time-consuming, but not too tricky. So, when you decide you want to build a corpus, what do you need to do? Okay? And in reality, there's three main things that you need to approach it with. And it's the three S's. You have to think about uh, the sources that you are going to use. Now, generally, it is, um, unless you want to, uh, go and use a wide variety of sources. Normally people, uh, or normally what we're looking for uh, in the situations where you're going to make them is uh, going to be small, specific corpuses. I don't think any of you want to try and start tackling a, a uh, two billion word corpus of general English. It's going to take you quite a long time to build it. Um, so what we're looking at is much smaller corpuses. So we want to look at the sources, and generally the same sources. Maybe newspapers, maybe scripts from a television show, maybe radio transcripts of radio programs, transcripts from your textbooks, for example. All of these things um, could be our different sources. Then again, we get to the issue of the size. What is the size of the corpus? Now, it's a, different balance, a difficult balancing act to make sure that you have a corpus which is big enough so that you're going to be able to get a variety of results and a corpus that is so big that it's going to distort all the results. So the more specific thing that you're looking for, the smaller you want to make the corpus. And this, this specific... I can never say this word. Specificity. Okay. All right. Because the more specific an, a thing that you are looking to research the more detailed it needs to be when you search for the information. For example, on the corpus I built, looking at these three words, I, as I said to you, I took it from newspapers. Okay, um, That would have been a heck of a lot of material to go through if I was going to take all newspapers, uh, six months of all newspapers. So what I did was searched within political-based text. So I made the specific judgment to only limit myself to, to political-based texts. Okay, so this is the idea of making sure that what, if you're looking for something specific, make the corpus specific. So, how do we actually build it? How do we actually go from uh, material on the internet, which is normally the easiest way, to actually having that corpus? So, what, we come to this idea of source. Now, I'm going to talk to you in one specific term about a specific corpus I made. It was uh, in... Uh, response to reading some really, really boring CAE reviews of films. Okay, I asked, uh, I gave my students a, a task. They had to do one of the CAE writings, and uh, my God, there was a lot of goods. The acting was good, the film was good, this was good. I was, by, and by the time I got to my 30th one, I was like, oh my God, if I see the word good. Again, I'm going to throw something. So I decided that I wanted to create a corpus uh, based around naturally occurring reviews so students could see how people actually write them. So one way I could have done this is just to turn around and give them two reviews. Got them to read them, got them to have a look at it. But then by giving them two, I'm giving them 
two possible ways of doing it. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to feed them lots of options. So what I did was I took two sources. It was one magazine and one blog. And I decided that I was going to take uh, 50 reviews from each of the two sources written by different people. So I took five, I took, uh, I took, um, I took 10 five-star reviews, 10 four-star reviews, 10 three-star reviews, 10 two-star reviews, and 10 one-star reviews from each text to create uh, 100 reviews, okay? So how do you do this? It's really simple. When stuff's online, it's incredibly simple. It's a simple job of find the article, you copy it, you paste it into a Word document, and this is where the change comes. Normally, you save a Word document. Normally, we don't even think about it. We just put in the file name, save. But this is where the, the, one of the slight changes comes. Uh, because most corporate can't read Word documents. They're far too complex. Okay? So what we need to do is save it as a much more basic format. Okay? So often we don't even think about this where it says save as type. But if you go to where it says save as type and you change it from Word document to plain text, what you get is something much more basic, which is that. Okay. Now you're going, ah, I remember seeing something very similar to this at the beginning. Okay. So what happens is by the time you do this a hundred times, is we end up with something that looks like that. This huge text which, as I said, looks incredibly intimidating and uh, looks like it's impossible to actually get anything from it. And it is in this format. You're not going to be able to do anything with it in this format. What you need to do is get hold of the application or the program that can work for you, do all the hard work for you and actually analyze this. So I'm going to show you one. I don't know this person, just to make it very clear. I'm not advertising for anybody, but this is Ant Conk. Um, it was created by Lawrence Anthony. Okay, it's freely available, which is the key aspect. Okay, it's freely available um, and very easy to download onto any PC or, and I think they have a different, slightly different Mac way, and you download it onto your Mac. Okay, so it's very easily downloadable and absolutely free. Okay, and once you put this on your computer, rather than what we saw before, uh, we're going to have now this. We're going to have this program. Okay, and this is our interface. This is our corpus interface. And it's going to let us then turn around and take one of these files, a plain text file, and then if we upload it, we then have the possibility of analyzing all that language that you've spent a lot of time collecting. So let's look at some of the functions really quickly and show you what they can do. Okay? So a really simple one is if you can see at, at the top of that, we have all the different functions like concordance, concordance plot, view file, cluster forms, colloc uh, collocates, word list. Okay? Um, I would have selected word list, and I very simply press sort. And that and the program within probably dependent on the size, between 10 seconds and one minute, dependent on the size, turns around and uh, will tell you how many times every single word appears in your text. Now, unsurprisingly, in, a, in this one, which is 145,000 words, the is the most common word. Okay? That's not surprising. But by scrolling down, what we can start to see are words that occur more commonly within your corpus. Okay? Now, if you want to search for a specific word, if you go to where it says concordance, I'll give you an example, concordance. I don't know why. I was there just looking for a word that I didn't think, I thought will probably appear, but... Uh, but not too often, so it's not too confusing. And I put in dragon. I don't know why. Um, but dragon. So the word dragon appeared twice in my corpus. And what we can see now is, very simply, it's given me 
uh, the two examples of that word within the sentences that it appears in. Six to seven words one side, six to seven words the other side. Okay, So that we can read and start to make assumptions based upon the type of um, language that surrounds on the corpus. Now, if this isn't enough, sometimes you can get this and, uh, and it's not enough context for you to understand how the word's being used. If we then click on that word, it actually shows you where that word appears in your corpus and you can read what's before it, what's after it, as far ahead or far, or far after as you need to, to be able to understand the context completely. Okay. But there, that's not all it can do. There's a lot of other fantastic features. So we've looked at uh, it, how it works within concordances, but what about within collocations? Okay, again, when we're dealing with a word like dragon, I picked such a small uh, a word that occurred so little because I wanted uh, not to be inundated with hundreds of different collocates. So by looking at the bottom, I can pick, uh, it's, uh, I can pick how many words to each side of it. So I've selected two words to the left of my keyword and two words to the right of my keyword. And it's collected for me a list of the words that occur. Now, in this case, we can see in the corpus that we've used it in, we can really discover very little about this word dragon because we've only got two examples. Okay? None of the words occur more than once. Okay. Oh, well, no one does, like. Um, but when you are now going to, if you were to take within a political text the word socialist, which is going to have, as we said, 44 hits, and we're going to have two words to either side of it, we're now looking at 160 words. Okay? And we can start to see patterns because those words will not always be different. They will be the same. And we'll start to see when in 44 examples we have six occurrences of the same word, we can start to make assumptions about words that collocate together. Okay, but as I said, um, this is just a really basic overview of some of the functions that are available here. There are other amazing functions which I'm not going to go into, such as frequency lists, where you you upload a um, you can upload a base corpora, normally a big one, and then what you can do is just uh, compare the two of them, and it will tell you how many the words within your small corpora that occur much more frequently than in a big corpora, okay? So there's lots of fantastic technology out there that you can do, or lots of fantastic things that you can do with this piece of technology. And um, as I said, I'm not the best person necessarily to explain it to you. I think personally, the best person, and he thankfully has done it, is uh, the person who created it, which was Lawrence Anthony, as I said. He's uh, on YouTube. He has lots and lots and lots of tutorials where he teaches you how to do all these things and can walk you through it step by step. Okay. I believe you can also send messages to him and contact him and ask him questions. So it's, there's, even if you have doubts or worries or are unsure about things, there is all of this type of information is out there. So let's move on to this last point. I want to save the last 10 minutes for this, which is how can I bring this into the classroom? Because this is the real key. Okay. Hopefully I've explained to you why corporates are important. Hopefully I've explained to you why companies use them, uh, like Macmillan, Cambridge. All these companies are embracing corpora. Um, but how is that relevant to you in the classroom? How is that relevant to your students? And it is. Okay. So there are three real ways that you can approach corpora in, uh, with your students. The first one is very simple. Okay. This is a free piece of technology. Uh, try and get it downloaded onto your computers at school. And lots of you have language labs or um, computer classrooms. Have a talk. Normally, when things are free, they're much more likely to let you get things. Um, so if you put this free piece of technology on them, you can create corporate, and you can start to get your students at, um, at, work, um, at school interacting with this type of technology. But you're not limited to what you can do at school. Okay? Why not embrace what you can do in the home? 
more importantly, what your students can do in their home. Again, we're talking about free technology that's out there. There's no reason in the, in the teaching settings that most of us are teaching in where mo almost all of our students are going to have computer access, internet access. Why can we not ask them to put a simple program onto their computer that we can send out to them a corpus and set them tasks to do? Okay. Start teaching them that la researching and investigating into language is not just something that is, in, is stuck within the confines of a classroom. It's got to be part of their life. Okay? So it's really beneficial if we can get our students in their own home interacting with this type of technology. And the third one is, it's a lot less tech, techy, but... There's also uh, the nice simple option of with things like snipping tools now, you can easily quickly take photographs of concordances, copy them onto a piece of, uh, and paste them onto a, or in a Word document and print them out. Okay. It's a much more or less techy solution, but it can be just as successful. Okay. Because if we think about this, the great thing about uh, working with corporates is it, it embraces both types of working. Um, it's, it's just as easy to have the students sat in a group looking at different concordance lines and discussing what, uh, what they can infer from this meaning and sharing ideas and collaborating with each other, with each other as it is to actually just give them it individually and have them working on it and thinking of their own individual ideas. It's an incredibly flexible piece of work, okay? And it depends on what you want to do with it. If you want to give it to your students, if you want to get your students talking and communicating, you can use it. If you want to calm them down after doing something much more energetic, get them, give them a couple with three questions. Look at these three words. Tell me, what you can, tell me what you can do about it. And you'll be amazed after a couple of times experimenting with this type of exercise, the type of things that the students can actually infer about the language that they're dealing with. They're actually very good at it. So what I'm going to do is show you some other activities, more, some, some more specific activities, which I think are very successful and I think would be very useful. So... Uh, again, let's return to this idea of this corpus I talked about, okay, that I built. I want to tell you about some of the activities I did with it. Uh, there, and I've got four key activities, okay. The first one, uh, and I've split them into two areas. One is pre-teaching, one is uh, redrafting. So in pre-teaching, um, we talk about key words, but this key word is, um, and I will use this definition by Scott, what he means by a key word. And what I mean by a key word is words whose frequency is unusually high in comparison with some norm. So within a corpus on cinema, there are many words which we could expect to see much more frequently than if it was a general corpus. Words like director, words like movie, words like... There are a lot of words okay, which we could obviously guess at. But by showing our students words that they wouldn't normally guess at, which occur much more frequently, we can start to make them think about the type of language which is specific to this genre of writing. Now, equally, I can pick out specific words that I want them to look at. Okay? As I said to you, when my students did uh, a list of reviews, the actor was good, the actress was good, the director was good, this was good and I wanted to kill myself after reading 30 of them. So why not pick out some words that you want the students to look at? Okay? It's not a case of picking out the complex adjectives you want, but pick out the simple words that you want them to look at and that you want them to put interesting adjective collocations with them. I'll show you some in a minute. Okay. Then we come to the idea of redrafting, the idea of um, correcting the misuse of vocabulary. Look for commonly occurring words that the students get wrong. There's always some. Then get them to search them within a corpus. What they're going to be able to see is that they're using this word wrong uh, or, or incorrectly and, maybe, and start to maybe think of substitutions that they could use. Okay. Or uh, if... For example, in the case of my good, 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 
um, we can start to pick out some specific words for them and um, ask them to look at the type of interesting vocabulary that they could use instead. So, I'm not sure how... Okay, thank you. All right, yes, you can read this. So, um, just for one, I took the word performance. So I could feed my students the word. I want you to use the word performance. I want you, when you're talking about actors and actresses, to talk about how well they perform. Not the actor is good, talk about their performance. And then we've got some absolutely fantastic vocabulary just taken from this. Okay, heartfelt, outstanding, emotionally packed, powerful, note perfect, raw. I like that one, a raw performance. Uh, terrific, Oscar worthy. Within, that took me, with the Corpus Technology, with the Corpus program open, that took me 10 seconds to be able to just type in the word performance, press search, and it fed me all of this information. And imagine that your students are doing this with a lot of vocabulary. The quality of their writing, the interest level of it are, are going to go up. Again, let's look at some more specific examples uh, with like actor, actress, director, edit, editor, editing, edited. Okay, and we can find lots of collocations. We can look for collocations, words that occurred multiple times. So we had character actor to describe an actor who, you know, you know their face, but you can never remember who they are. Okay, uh, a solid actor, charismatic, celebrated. Then we had words uh, that went with the actress, world class, spectacular, talented, big name. All of this type of vocabulary. And honestly, I think uh, I've never seen in general, my students use these type of words, okay? So easy to get them to be able to do it. But it doesn't just, as I said, it doesn't just give us collocations, it can give us uh, concordances. So the type of sentences that these words uh, are placed within. So we had the director, and then the name of the director does a. So that, that structure appear, appeared about three or four times. So we can see a common structure that people use within reviews, okay? And it's not hard to get your students to turn around and go uh, with a simple question like, what, what structures can you see on multiple occasions? Get them to search through them. They will be able to point out that this is the same structure as that structure of that structure. Okay, and they're going to start to make assumptions about how they use those words. Again, with edit, editor, editing, these, all these words, um, we had the same type of structure uh, mirrored as we had with director. Then we had lots of other interesting um, adjectives like flashy, quick, fine-tuned, editing, and pacing. Uh, so just by literally 10, 15 minutes work, this would be for your students, you can dramatically change the type of language that they're using within their texts. Now, there are other ways to do it. Okay, because maybe not everybody has the time to go out and collect a hundred texts which they're going to put together. So um, often our textbooks are feeding lots and lots of interesting vocabulary to our students, and after five minutes they've forgotten the vocabulary. One thing that is uh, easy to do is build a corpus based on the articles, the language, which is given in context within the textbooks. Okay, or if you don't want to use that, how about going external? Get your students to go out there and pick texts that they find interesting to read, articles that for them are interesting to read. And you collect them together and save it in one file, and it's a corpus for your students to search through, look through, look through vocabulary, and uh, they can learn a lot from this. Okay. Another option is... Um, project work or research projects, presentations, getting a general corpus and asking your students to go in there and look for 10 phrasal verbs, okay? And get them to give ex an explanation to the class about how these phrasal verbs work. What else goes with this phrasal verb? Are these phrasal verbs transitive or intransitive? How are they going to know that? by seeing it in a corpus and seeing it repeated pattern of how we use these phrasal verbs, is how they're going to be able to make these assumptions and how they are going to be able to remember them. Okay? But if you're going to do things like this, just to make it really clear, as I said, these kind of general activities, research projects, you need really to use a larger corpus. Because as Moon said, a large reference corpus, at least, ideally at least 50 million words. I know that sounds a lot, but 
um, I've put on on the hand on the um, corpus collectors that I showed you earlier. There are multiple with over a billion words, so it's not hard for you to find. Okay, um, at least 50 million words are since smaller, and specialist corpora are likely to show skewings with the results. Okay, so I'm going to look at one final uh, of activity, and this is getting the students' own work to build a corpora. Okay. Now, you can look at this as either a collection of what they are, their initial drafts, or what I think is actually an even more valuable tool is after they've worked with their text, after they've put these, this interesting creative language into these texts, collect them and build a corpora with them. Give it to the students and let them experiment with it. Let them find out what they can about it. And I think the results that you'll be able to see in their quality of their writing will be very apparent. Okay. So, uh, I, st I put forward these questions at the beginning that I wanted you to be able to get by the end of this talk. I wanted you to know what we need to, uh, we, what we need to know to understand a word. I hope you know that. Uh, hope you understand the word doting a bit more specifically. Again, some uh, British English and American English words which are, very, uh, which are the same, but actually have these semantic prosody differences. And the final and key thing I want you to, hopefully, as you can answer yes to this, is uh, how could you use a corporate with your own class? Okay, I just, just to put on for anybody who's interested, uh, some of the texts where I've taken this information from, and uh, I'd like to say thank you, and if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> any questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Brandon, when you talk about the phrasal verbs and things, obviously some yeah. of these maybe you want to search for a specific phrasal verb. Mm -hmm. Can you enter search terms? Yeah, yeah, you can enter multiple words. You can enter, you can enter whole sentences. You can enter... But they're separated by other words. Do you need to say something? Uh, what you can do is, within the corpus, you can, you can get it to match within X amount of words of each other. Okay, as I said, that's getting into really complex things. As I said, the, the, all the tutorials are there for you if you want to go and do that. Yeah, you can uh, search for whole expressions, or you can, and then you can uh, advise the computer to look with it within a certain distance of each other within the text. Yeah, is there any other questions? Okay, well, yeah, another one, yeah. <laughs> Um, it depends. I've not tried to download that onto, a, uh, onto the Ankong, onto a tablet. Uh, it's not available right now in an app. I think I read he's trying to develop it to make it available as an app. I'm sure if people let him know that we would love that, because I personally would love it if he could do that, I think it would be uh, fantastic. Yeah, but right now, I don't think it's available on, uh, to be put onto a tablet. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay.